Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron Kramer, uh, head of uh, BSR, Nonprofit Business Network, that focuses on sustainability. I'm delighted uh, to uh, be able to host a discussion today on the safe uh, advantage. Um, uh, you know, the, the world uh, moves very quickly and in nonlinear ways. And uh, this year alone, we've had uh, Ebola in West Africa. We've had E. coli issues in the United States. Of course, there have been uh, multiple food safety issues uh, here in China. We've seen Fukushima, uh, Sandy, no region of the world, no community in the world. None of us individually uh, can take safety for granted. Um, and we also know that in addition, of course, to our uh, personal exposure uh, for business, this is an absolutely crucial issue. Uh, trust is the kind of thing that gets built over a long period of time. Um, and it can be destroyed in, in a nanosecond, uh, very, very fast. There is a famous quote from uh, a 19th century American writer, Mark Twain, uh, who said that a lie makes its way around the world before the truth puts on its pants. I hope that our translators today can, uh, can translate that. Um, and, um, and he said that before there was uh, WeChat, Snapchat, Vine, Instagram, or any of the tools that, of course, have, have just accelerated uh, our world. So we want to explore all of that uh, today. This is something that affects all of us as, as, uh, as consumers, as family members, and we've got uh, four great business leaders uh, to talk about how they're thinking about it. Um, I should just note from the program, unfortunately, one of our uh, planned speakers, uh, Mr. Gogo, uh, was not able to go-go or get here. Uh, thanks to a, a long flight delay coming from, uh, from, I think, from North America. Uh, but we've got four great people here, and we're going to dive right in. So I want to start by, I'll ask uh, a couple of questions and ask each of you to respond. Um, and then I'll follow up with some questions for each of you individually. And I want to make sure to open it up. We're in a, a round uh, room so that we can be as participatory uh, as possible and hopefully get into a, a great dialogue. So let me start. Um, first and, and ask each of you, uh, and uh, um, starting with Katie Lam uh, from, uh, from PepsiCo, um, how have consumer expectations changed over the last five, ten years? If you can answer that question, we'll go around, get each of your perspectives uh, on that. Katie. Uh, I, I want to start by addressing um, the audience. And good morning, uh, and really um, happy to be here. Um, to have this forum to talk about really important issues, uh, but most of um, the dialogue is going to be in Chinese because um, I think that that's uh, appropriate also for the audience. We're in China, so um, that's yes. so. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to say good morning to all the participants. I'm very honored to be participating in today's forum on a very important issue. First of all, I will be talking mostly in Chinese to tailor more towards the Chinese audience in China. Maybe they don't have to rely on the headset so much. Aaron proposed a very important question about the change in expectation of consumers on safety. In the past, we've noticed that there had been a lot of spotlights shed on the food security. Consumer definitely pay more, a lot more attention to food security and safety. I think this is very closely linked to the emerging of the social media and new media. Also, people are gaining more awareness on the health issues. Consumers themselves are treating safety issues with their utmost attention, so they pay, they follow mo a lot more closely. We noticed that with the role of the new media, the issue have increased their exposure. I think we'll we'll get into the question of how media are changing things, trying to focus later on on. How do they change your life day to day? Yeah. How do you have to respond in real time? Wu Hu Gong, um, you've uh, led your company uh, uh, and been with your company for quite some time, and you've seen really the entire reform period in China. So in addition to the last five or 10 years, I wonder if you can think how Chinese perspectives on safety uh, have, uh, have changed your life uh, over that period. 
I am from Zhangzhi Island, and、uh, we manufacture maritime food. Thanks to the opening up and reform in the past years, the dispensable income level had increased, has in, has been increasing, and as a result. This is changing their diet structure. There is there there is new demand for the food that、uh, consumers want. In recent years, the central government have attached great importance to food safety as a result, direct result of the food scandals. Madam Lin had mentioned that the role of new media. Has accelerated the awareness penetration among the society as a whole. It's no longer limited to one region or one enterprise. It's become an international issue. Certainly, therefore, it had helped the consumers as a whole to pay closer attention to food safety. After that, I want to touch upon the point that the government has been. Improving regulations governing food safeties and implementation and、uh, law enforcement have stepped up as well. So, all of these forces joining hands together are pushing the consumers to even pay closer attention to it. In the past years, we have noticed that with the increased consumption power. The confidence among consumers have been dropping. Therefore, consumers have less trust, even though they want to consume more. It makes it difficult for businesses, and it is also proposing a challenge to the economy's development as a whole. Thank you. So we have social media bottom up. Uh, dynamic. We have rising income, consumer information, another bottom-up、uh, trend, and then the top-down trend of, of increased enforcement by the government. Tim, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but let's go to the third、uh, food manufacturer retailer we've got here. Nandu,、uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective about how <coughs> opinions、uh, and expectations around safety have changed in recent years. Thank you, Aaron.、Uh, Look, the fir first thing to and and let's pull back and look at this from a broader and and global perspective.、Uh, the first thing to realize is today, for the first time in the history of humanity, 50 percent of humanity now lives in urban areas. So one in every two human beings lives in a city somewhere. This means the only way, and this is and this is accelerating, and the only way. You can make food available in urban areas, is by having sophisticated food supply chains and processing of food that keeps food fresh and preserved till it reaches the consumer. And this obviously then leads us to the questions of food safety. And the second point here is, in actual fact, we have made enormous progress in food safety, which we tend to discount. Uh, in in the light of some of the recent scandals that have happened,、uh, reportedly in the United Kingdom, when pasteurization of milk was introduced coming into the urban areas, rates of tuberculosis dropped by 75 percent. So there's a lot of positive force in in the controls introduced along the value chain. Having said that,、uh, you know there is no. Uh, getting away from the fact, you alluded to a few、uh, food safety scares in recent times. There, there have been issues which have cropped up in various different parts of the world on food safety, and not just on food safety, also on food adulteration, sometimes deliberate, which is a, quite a criminal kind of an act. So, what 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 could be the the response in this kind of a scenario? And I'd like to. Present a three-pronged response.、Uh, really, the first response is the consumer part and consumer awareness, which Kathy and Mr. Wu referred to, is a very important part of increasing the pressure on food safety throughout the value chain. The second response is regulatory, and again, Mr. Wu referred to it. Governments are taking a more proactive stance. In making sure that standards are put, that they are adhered to across the value chain, and the third response has to be from industry. And within industry, 
and I, re I, I go back and refer to uh, one word that you used, which in Nestle is very important to us, and that is trust. The ultimate objective of everything we do in Nestle is to build trust in Nestle. And the surest way to build trust is through every one of the one billion times a day somebody chooses and uses a Nestle product somewhere in the world. The fastest way to lose trust is to have bad quality or safety in that product. So within this context of building trust, there are a number of things we can do and we do do. Uh, uh, and I uh, just talk about it in three, three buckets. The first is, what are we doing to monitor? Yeah, we, we have, across the world, more than a thousand scientists who are engaged in monitoring food safety. Every day, we have more than 260,000 tests that are conducted to make sure that the raw materials and finished products are of the highest standard in our, in our uh, manufacturing chain. The second thing is to ensure traceability. And to ensure traceability, we are doing a lot of backward integration. We have more than almost 700,000 farmers who we work with all over the world. Last year alone, we provided direct assistance to upgrade the capabilities of 300,000 farmers all over the world. We have 1,000 agronomists working to do this. Traceability is embedded in our supply chain. Consumers can go and now scan the QR code at the bottom of the can to trace where the product came from and, and in what batch it is and, and, and all kinds of details about the product. So we have a lot of investment happening on monitoring, on traceability. In Beijing, we just opened our Food Safety Institute that we were talking about earlier. And uh, this is something that is open, and this brings me to my third point of our response, which is to be able to work with regulators and industry bodies to help to frame and shape the regulations to ensure the highest standard of food in the entire value chain. Uh, so the Food Safety Institute is something which is open uh, to regulators and scientific institutions to come and work to help to upgrade standards across the industry. So it's a long journey, but it's a journey that's worth it because ultimately the only way to build a sustainable business over a long period of time and to support this whole trend of urbanization is to build trust. It comes back to that word trust. If you put that front and center of your mission, it's obvious what one has to do. Thank you. I think I'm glad you mentioned urbanization. We talked about social media, rising expectations. And I think you make a very important point, which in fact, our food chain may be safer than it was 100 years ago, but because of the flood of knowledge, uh, it may not appear so. Someone from uh, another food company said, uh, that serves 50 million people a day, said if you have a one in a million uh, event, we have 50 of those every day. So the, the scope of these businesses, I think, is, is uh, uh, is part of is part of the challenge, Tim. I wanted to to uh, have you uh, in the fourth spot here because you work with a lot of companies like this, including companies in other sectors apart from food. So you have a very good perspective on how things have changed uh, from from Ecolab. How have expectations changed over the last five years or so? Well. Um both as a consumer myself and, and also as you point out that uh, Ecolab, we do work with uh, uh, people, I mean the companies in the food and beverage and many industries that uh, helping them to, to deal with the food safety challenges, including many of the companies on the stage. Um, uh, first of all, from consumer aspect, and I do think uh, like uh, many Chinese people, we, we changing from making sure we have enough food to feed the family to actually the quality and safety become our top concern. And nutrition, quality, and safety become our top concern. So, and I really, the, the whole change is driving the change and evolution of the industries. And, um, and from, a con from consumer behavior change or expectation change standpoint, um, uh, we did a lot of research with our customers and also with the, the industry associations. And uh, one of the questions that we ask our, uh, our customer's customer, which is consumer, to, to answer is when they decide what to buy, or what restaurants to go to, and what are the criteria they, 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 they use to make decisions. And we saw a, a pretty dramatic change in the last five years, especially after the melanin 
the, the, the whole food scandal happened. Um, it used to be, it start with taste, right? I want to make sure that these things are tasting good and, and, and price because consumers are more sensitive to price. But now, more and more you'll find that the taste and price become the third or fourth or even fifth uh, the decision uh, making criteria for them is the number one is become food safety. They want to make sure that they go there and they can feel safe to take their customers or take their families to. And number two is the quality, which is also more or less li linked to the food safety. So we do think um, uh, the overall consumer expectations is evolving. And of course, the government regulations that you point out are evolving, like as having a dramatic impact on on the overall uh, the, the food industries that uh, mm -hmm. in large in China. Uh, but also, I mean, I would say globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, one question for all of you, and then I'll, I'll focus in a little bit. The, the title of the session is The Safe Advantage. But I wonder, do you think there's really an advantage, or is this uh, avoidance of, of risk? Do, you, do, you, do companies get uh, rewarded in the marketplace for having the kind of quality and authenticity uh, that, that Tim is speaking to? I'll go, no order here. Yeah, go ahead. Right, well, if we look at the title of the session, it's about safety being a competitive advantage, um, which is kind of unfortunate because it's something that uh, consumers ought to be able to rely on food being safe. But the fact that it's become the title of this session is because of a lot of things that have happened which have told us that there's a certain insecurity out there. Now, whether it's in the upstream or downstream or business government corporation, Food safety should actually be the bottom line for all of us. It should be guaranteed by all of us compared to innovation, brands, and so on. I mean, the latter should be competitive advantages rather than food safety. Now, I actually agree with the point that should be made that food safety is more of a concern for people than before. Um, we need to make further effort to reassure consumers. We actually have a commitment at PepsiCo, for example, sustainable human development, sustainable environmental development, and sustainable training of people. Now, human and environmental sustainable development both include food safety as an element. Now, we produce and sell products that we're proud of, and trust is a huge part of that. And it's a huge part of our staff being proud of the products that they sell. It's part of corporate culture, in fact. A lot of processes and monitoring mechanisms depend for their implementation, effective implementation, on corporate culture, the ability of all of our people to work together so that, with their help, the company can continuously improve. Now, I would say at this point that besides rules and laws and systems, we also have, when we talk about implementation, the issue of corporate culture, which is decisive. And it's also about the relationships that we have at the industry level and with the regulators. These decide whether or not we can guarantee food safety for the consumer. Consumers previously wouldn't really expect there to be a problem. Maybe that's different today. They know more. And what they've seen, some of it, causes concern. We need to 
give a response. We need to persuade the consumer that they don't need to worry. And that's the key lesson that I take from our session today. You measure um, whether the brand or, or certain products in any way are benefited by this approach. Can you quantify that? Um, it's hard to do. Uh, well, if you're talking about qualitative criteria for food safety or uh, as a part of uh, corporate performance, then it divides into two aspects in fact. Firstly, whether or not consumers have confidence. I mean, we actually very seldom worry about, you know, what company produced this, where it's come from. I mean, when, when you're dealing with a big company, the sort of reassurance that you should give to the consumer is an overall sort of confidence in product quality. Now, can you put a qu quantitative finger on it? Well, it, it's very difficult. Over the past uh, year or so, there's been a survey and the results for China as follows, trusted brands by Chinese consumers include all of our products. Um, now, I'm sh confident in third party surveys, but also we've done internal surveys. And these surveys have been not just about what products they trust, but why. Um, so we're aware of the results of those surveys, but it's harder to break it down further in mathematical or number terms. I don't think it should be a matter of numbers. It should be a basic guarantee that people enjoy. I, I'd like to Please. You know, agree with uh, Cathy. Food safety should actually be a foundation of any responsible food manufacturer. But what builds a competitive advantage is how well your culture allows you to keep that foundation intact year after year after year. And then you build a reputation. And that's where the reputation then comes and gives you trust eventually. So, and if we measure, I, I know in the case of Nestle, we do measure uh, the corporate equity uh, in, uh, with quantitative measures uh, and qualitative as well. And we, we, what we see across the world, one theme that gets played back consistently, and China is, is also the, the, exactly the same, is that over time, people come to associate Nestle with quality. And that is not, I mean, it was not designed to be a competitive advantage. It has evolved to become one simply because of consistency over time. And I, I think, and I'd like to test this with you, there's a self-reinforcing element of this because if it's culture that drives safety, presumably uh, culture is also strengthened when people see that the company is doing things the way that yeah. they would like. And so that- And, and willing to make hard decisions yeah. occasionally. Yeah. When you have to make a hard decision, they will, you know, when you're willing to take the hard calls, then in, inside people say, yes, we're serious about it. Trust has to be earned internally, not just externally. Not just externally. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, then, then Mr. Wu. It's, it's, so, so again, we, we are more, more or less objective in this. Um, uh, when we look at um, uh, the food safety as a competitive advantage, and, and since we work with companies with uh, like Nestle, Pepsi, with great brand awareness, and versus uh, some companies are, are still in a very early stage of uh, establishing their brands, and we do actually think that's a, a very clear competitive advantage. When, when you perceived value by the consumers, that your food, you, the, the food safety is not an issue or your quality is good and consistency, uh, consistency is there. And, and that's why we, we think um, um, having the culture, having the processes uh, is, is critical. And, and, then, uh, and, and at the end of the day, the food safety is, is also a matter of investments. In order to establish the food safety culture, you need to make investments. In, in, in order to establish the food safety processes and infrastructure, you need to make the investments. And investment is a, a financial equation. So, um, uh, so we actually encourage, uh, especially the customers who are still in the early journey of establishing a food safety culture is to consider and either quantify, try to quantify, maybe not necessarily the benefit, but the cost of food safety. And which is you can easily by refer to some of the 
the instance happened in the industry say, oh, what would happen if there's any negative publicity related to our brands or our companies and how that could impact us. And so the cost side of uh, the food safety is a lot easier to quantify the, the upside or the benefit side of it. So when you put the cost in the equations and all of a sudden investing some money to strengthen your food safety culture, strengthen your food safety processes or foundations become a, a much easier decision because ultimately, as a company, uh, the fin every decision comes to financial equations. So I, I do think, um, I mean, I, of course, for Pepsi and Nestle, this has become a given to you, it become part of your culture, is less of issues, but for many other companies, this is uh, something I do encourage those companies to, uh, to consider doing that. I, I think it's a very good point, Tim. People should not look at investment in food safety and quality as a cost, mm -hmm. but they should look at it as one of the foundation essentials of doing business properly in mm -hmm. a sustainable way. Yeah. You won't get me to argue with that point at all. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Wu, um, uh, how, do you think you have an advantage in the marketplace because of your reputation for quality and safety? Well, firstly, food safety definitely is a competitive advantage, although rationally speaking, it is the bottom line. The actual um, incidents that are happening with food safety are not just in the developing world, however, for example, in the USA with uh, the adding of water to seafood products. Now that's partly a safety issue, but also very much about quality assurance. Following the Fukushima incident in Japan, with the marine pollution that occurred, and the inability to immediately control the consequences of that. Now, Australian and, well, particularly Australian, but also New Zealand um, prawn and lobster is often smuggled via Vietnam to China, which means that it's actually avoiding all the quality regulation and checks that it ought to be going through. So there's a risk to the consumer if you don't have the necessary systems, laws, and regulations in place and working, then the food safety marketplace becomes chaotic. So it's not just about the bottom line, it's also about capacity, the ability to get things done. Now, everybody knows that there's no action that doesn't affect the environment. There's nothing that happens in the environment that doesn't affect food. And there's nothing that affects with food that doesn't affect people. So it's very clearly about capacity building and that's something that every business should be doing. Some businesses want to make it one of their criteria but they don't have the capacity or the ability or sometimes even the money to actually get it done properly to get that capacity built up. Now, why do I say it's about competitiveness? Not just because of that. Um, it's also about uh, one of the basic building blocks of your brand, um, whether it's uh, Pepsi or Nestle or Jiang Zida, my company for that matter. Um, if you don't take food safety seriously enough, then you simply can't build a brand and you can't build a healthy corporate culture in that respect. Well, when we produce seafood, how do we regulate our own food safety chains? How do we increase our capacity in that regard? First, starting from the uh, procurement, we have regulated specific zones where we procure from. That's one thing. And also, I agree with Madame Lin that it's about co corporate culture how you positioned yourself when you established the company and how you see yourself develop in the future, you need to ask whether you want to make money or you want to benefit the people. And that will decide the tone for the corporate culture as a whole. And that will, in turn, 
plays important impact on the uh, safety insurance. After that, I want to touch upon the uh, necessity of enhancing laws and regulations without which, without effective monitoring or independent in, uh, monitoring, what we're talking about are in vain. Developed countries definitely stepped ahead of us in terms of either the formulation of the regulations nor, uh, or the implementation for developing countries. We have a long way to catch up. And uh, we, on top of those, we need to have the systems and processes in place to further ensure that our products meet the safety requirement. With all of these factors putting together, I believe we will be able to make food safety a competitive edge. Much. Um, so four strong votes for culture as being crucially important. I think that's a, a very good insight. Um, let me ask one question, ask you to respond very briefly, and then I want to open it up for questions uh, from, from all of you. Um, you know, in the news this week is yet another example of hacking and uh, information being held in the cloud um, that is uh, basically stolen. Now, um, as we move towards an Internet of Things, as we, as we uh, begin to think about how enterprises are connected in that regard, it becomes not very hard to think about how hackers can turn from taking photographs of celebrities uh, to manipulating uh, the extensive information systems you have that, that look after this, um, and in some cases interfering with uh, with machinery that's operating to do some of the testing that you're talking about. Is this on your radar screen? What, looking ahead, um, is this something that, that keeps any of you awake at night? At Nestle, we do have a, uh, a very rigorous program of an early warning system mm -hmm. where we try to look out uh, and, and look at the environment uh, to look at what are the issues that may uh, crop up, not just today, but in a few years from now, looking at the leading edge of science. And uh, it's not only on food safety, but also on information security. And we try to then anticipate some of these issues and build them into our processes to make sure we have the safeguards built in. Uh, this is a very important part of maintaining the sustainability over time. And that's what the culture allows us to do. Uh, take, I mean, take, going back to uh, food safety, for instance, we know, you know, I, I distinguished earlier uh, between deliberate contamination of the food chain right. and uh, a food safety issue simply because of bad management of the food chain. Huh? Now, there's a third one in there, actually, which is today more and more detection technologies have progressed to a point where you can detect elements in parts per billion that previously nobody was aware that these elements were there. Now, where did they come from? They come from nature. They come from the grass the cow eats. Uh, you know, and, and that is creating a whole new dimension because simply the detection technologies, even if it is well below safety limits, can be blown up by consumer reaction, by media, to become something that people then react very strongly to. And so all of these we have to anticipate and try and stay ahead of the curve to try to preempt and prepare ourselves for some of these issues before they happen. Is deliberate interference with, uh, with food systems something that is in the top 10 of, of risks at, at Nestle these days? It's, well, I wouldn't say it's uh, something that's specific. I mean, it's uh, contamination of the food chain is something that we have been checking for for a long time. As long as we've had milk coming from farmers, we have not only looked at microbiological quality uh, and basic uh, fat protein balance, and, uh, but also at possibility of uh, any contamination. So we have had fairly rigorous systems going back for a century, more than a century now. And as technology progresses, as we are more able to detect, we upgrade the, the level of tests that we do. Deliberate interference uh, with, with quality, is this something you're concerned about? Um, every, uh, every year in Pepsi, we would conduct risk assessment. 
in the corporate management. Food safety has always been prioritized within the internal assessment process. It's not ranked as among the top level risk um, segment. Every year, we would have a specific procedure to assess to assess the risks involved from the procurement to the logistic to the processing to the treatment based on also the feedback we receive from R&D center to the product control, we would conduct all the assessments. So risk assessment has always been on our agenda. In terms of the level of risks, currently within Pepsi, within our management and corporate governance structure, we don't rank it as high as some of the other issues. But again, it's considered as one of the thresholds. It has, however, always been on our agenda, always on our radar. We would conduct annual checks, annual assessments and improvements. And also, we would look into the awareness and attention level that given by the staff. So this is a routine measure that we take at Pepsi. Given how open everything is and how everything is traded nowadays, starting traceability to the very source and origin certainly impose challenges. In other words, food safety would probably have a higher risk level compared with 10 years ago because we're looking at different logistic links and different processes. Regard and with regard to that, we also notice that it provides us a brilliant opportunity because of the Internet of Things, because of the development of technology. We are able to implement on hands control of all the processes the cold chain logistics, the development of, of the cold chain logistics is definitely beneficial to the storage, the safe storage and logistic uh, for food. Given that my company is a food stuff company, we attach great, in great importance to the not only the product safety, but also the safety to the environment. It, I must say on our agenda, it probably enjoys a higher status. Of course, I must say that we need to borrow expertise and factors from other fields, for example, from the academic, from the other um, independent consultancy, as well as management um, professionals to help us to even further enhance our control. And also, I must say, media's role is very important. It kind of helps us to ensure that the transparent process is implemented. And with the information disclosure, the timely information disclosure is crucial to our enterprise before we have had incidents, of course. But because of the blocked information channels, consumers were probably not as aware so I agree with uh, what Kathy's just said. Now, even though we hear more about these incidences, but we need to know that there are less incidences. The, the whole hacking mm -hmm. and how that relates to our food safety systems and, and also the, the whole traceability set of equations. And, and, and we, we actually often ask by our customers to help them provide the information to both monitor their food safety, but also improve their operational efficiencies, like both in the water or in the food safety processes. And, and we actually have a, our own uh, the system we call the 3D tracer systems that um, use in the industrial water treatments and also using in the, uh, the cleaning uh, in place uh, processes. And, and, and critical part of our consideration because our system directly linked with uh, our customers manufacturing or production processes. So, so the, the, the system integrity is critical. 
because um, uh, if there's any hacking into our systems, they can also go to impact you're our. Out of, you're out of business. Right. I mean, I mean yeah. it, that, so so I think so. You the the the, the questions you addressed was one of the things that uh, are fundamental to to our service to our customers and also to our competitive advantage, and then and then going to uh, the whole making sure the whole food chain um, are having the integrity on food safety. Um, we 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 are one of the biggest providers in the cleaning sanitation. Uh, chemicals and, and, and processes in the, uh, our customers, and and we don't want our chemical become a source of contamination, uh, which is actually that uh, happens in, uh, in 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 other places. Sure. And and that's why when we manufacture our um, uh, sanitizers or, or cleaning chemicals, and we actually use the same GMP process as any food uh, food and beverage companies they produce in the processes and and the, the entire process is uh, have to be uh, following a good manufacturing processes and um, last but not least and I, I do think um, this is not necessarily unique to China but more severe in China is when we look at the the overall food chain impact on the uh, food safety we we cannot overlook the potential impact on the environmental pollutions in China because a, a big part of our uh, um, the ingredients coming from water. And China, as we all know, the industrial water pollution is a big part of our issues. And when you take the water from the ground, and if you're not careful, and this can be a, a, a greater source of the contaminations going to the food chain. So, so now we, we actually uh, involve in many of the, the industry associations uh, research and um, uh, a conference, and we, we, we gradually had that uh, besides the the adulterations, and we talk about, and besides the food bond illness, and, and water and soil contaminations, another major threat to our food safety. And we talk about rice being contaminated, we talk about the manufacturing process being con contaminated. So I, I don't think um, a, a, a systematic view of the overall uh, food safety uh, is, is critical for us to making sure that uh, we don't have anything <coughs> that can come back and hurt our consumers. Human health. Uh, you know, food safety, environmental uh, health, they're, they're absolutely linked. Let's, um, let's hear some questions or comments from all of, all of you. We've got, uh, I think, a couple of microphones around, I believe, um, and I see three, four hands. Let's take uh, the questions, let's take three at a time, and if you can identify yourself uh, and your organization and keep questions brief, we'd all be very appreciative. Let's start with uh, with, with our friend right here, and then we can go over the gentleman in blue. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing. My, I, my question will... Can you identify yourself, too? Okay. Ben. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shasha. I come from International Finance News and the People's Daily. Um, because nowadays in China, I think safety for food, people worry about most is the genetic modified food. <laughs> Everyone is talking about it. Uh, so, but now in China, we do not have a clear standard about genetic modified food currently. But we already know that a lot of food already have genetic modified um, factors in it, especially some brand, very famous brands. And so my question first will goes to... Um, Currently, because everyone is so worried about it, but no one is offering the answer whether it's safe or not. Because people are worried, maybe its effect will not be only in decades, but for hundreds of years. Maybe after 100 years, we, we can see the effect of genetic modified food. So um, currently, do you think that um, it's a good chance for the big brands to get the trust from your consumer if you can guarantee that at least. I do not say it's safe or not. I say I guarantee if I have genetic modified factors in my food, I will show you, I will tell you exactly. So that's the first question. And the second let's, is... Let's try and keep it very brief because I want to get questions in okay. from others. So let's, and the second question is... So let's, no, 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 no. 这这个问题呢，就光这个问题可以谈三个小时呢，恐怕。所以呢，就先回答这个问题呢。好，我们先等着，先请其他的人就做做点贡献嘛。And then we've got a couple over here, and then we'll get some answers. 你好，我是来自网易。I'm from NetEase, and I would like to ask the guests, in particular from Nestle and PepsiCo, 
Um, a lot of your products contain food additives and uh, a lot of such chemical food additives are harmful to health even if they are allowed under national standards. Um, do you not see a paradox here? Let's go and, and I would ask that everyone uh, identify themselves. Gentleman right here and then the gentleman in the back. I'm Jeff, come from Leping Social Entrepreneurship Foundation. Uh, Okay. Um, frankly speaking, having listened to the executives from PepsiCo and Nestle, one thing that I haven't heard from these major brands is whether you think you deserve people's trust. And I think that's really a question that has to be asked, given a lot of things that have gone on. You don't automatically get that trust. In many cases, people don't have a trust. If I don't go to KFC, which is done by PepsiCo, then where do I go? Often there's no choice. Now, okay, KFC isn't a Pepsi, but I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, subsidiaries of Pepsi in the same way where you don't have real consumer choice. Now, in China, you have a lot of um, family farms and small and medium enterprises and so on. And micro enterprises in China, what innovative approaches can be adopted by market actors like that in China? This question, then we'll yep. hear some answers. Hi, everyone. My name is Ajay. I come from India. I work for a technologies company. And thanks for some very interesting viewpoints you shared with us a, a while ago. I'm very keen to know how are we empowering the consumers who are the most impacted of the lot? Because I think the real power or the teeth, as if may call it, for safety would come from consumers. So if they're more empowered, learned, and know most about the aspects. So are we transparent? Are we empowering them to know more about our products? I would like to know something in this. Thank Thank you very much. Some great questions. Let me try to bundle them. And I think first, I I do want to give uh, our colleagues from from PepsiCo and Nestle the chance to answer the the direct and very very provocative question about do do you deserve trust? I think that's in the minds of, of, of many people. Um, then, then maybe we'll hear a little bit about what information goes to consumers, including about GMOs, because I think that uh, fits together very well. Um, and then we can talk about additives uh, also. But, but first, uh, would you like to go first about yeah. you know, how do you deserve trust? Okay. Uh, well, there are a couple of things that I would like to uh, make clear. Firstly, um, PepsiCo contains food and drink departments. You're familiar with Pepsi Cola. We also have other products. Jia um, De Le and Chun Gu Le, which is a fruit juice brand. We also have Quaker Oats, which is a subsidiary of ours. And we have Lay's Potato Chips. These are some of the major brands in our stable. Now, at the factory level, but also at the field level, uh, what a lot of what we do is signing memoranda of understanding with agricultural departments. We have tens of thousands of farmers who supply us and who are audited every year for their use of fertilizer, um, environmental performance, irrigation, and so on. We communicate with them every year. We also have training activities together with the government for them. Apart from that element, in terms of our management and selection of inputs, we have various um, standards to ensure that everything that reaches our factory floor has guaranteed safe. We also have SOP monitoring and um, monitoring of our products in the market as well. Now, I won't go into detail because, again, that's something that could uh, easily run up to three hours or longer if I was to expound on that in full. Um, so that was just a basic overview of our food and drink monitoring and guarantee efforts. Now, it's been said just now that big brands don't deserve trusts. Well, 
actually, the fact that these brands have decades or centuries of history is not a coincidence. They have maintained quite strong consistency and continuity over the years, including in quality terms. Now, there's a lot of media coverage of incidents and scandals when they happen involving big brands. That's something that automatically draws the attention of consumers, but it doesn't mean that such problems don't happen with small brands, small companies. So big brands automatically get more coverage. Um, but if you go back over the history that we have at PepsiCo, in food terms, we really haven't had that many problems that have happened. Now, a lot of that's about internal management and processes, but also credit to our people at PepsiCo. We're very proud of our retail and sales people, including in procurement. Um, it's very fast usually for them to get back to us if any problems are found. I have been at PepsiCo for 20 years. One thing that we are very proud of is the fact that it was very easy for us to decide on that kind of food safety policy because it's part of our core mission. It's as simple as that. A brand with a history of over 100 years can't afford to sacrifice that. I think, I think the answer to summarize was yes, big brands do deserve uh, trust if they're doing the right things, and we just heard numerous examples. Uh, but Nandu, let's, let's, um, let's hear your perspective on this, and I do want to make sure we get to the other questions. Yep, I'll try and cover all four questions in a, in a very uh, summarized, uh, yes, summarized no, form. Yes, no, Absolutely and, right. Yeah, right. Short answers. Yeah. <laughs> but look, uh, trust is not something that's a given. Trust is something that you earn every single day. And trust is easy to lose when you have a product which is bad quality or not safe or is found to have contaminants that are not supposed to be there. It's easy to lose. And when we design our products and we have a culture of quality and compliance, this is something that has existed today for 150 years. And this reputation is not a given. Consumers don't come and say, yeah, Nestle, you're a big company, so I trust you. Consumers, and we have a lot of competition. So you have, they have enough choices in every single category to go and buy competition. So it's not that we don't have competition. You earn it every single day. And the consumer, at the end of the day, it's also our own families. We are human beings. My, my family consumes Nestle products. And we don't have additives. When we sell pure soluble coffee, it has pure soluble coffee, nothing else. When it's full cream milk powder, it's full cream milk powder. There are no additives. I fully agree. If there is any use of genetically modified ingredients, these have to be declared because these can be traced. And there are now more and more regulations across countries that uh, make it mandatory for companies to declare genetically modified ingredients on labels. But, but in, in this context, it, you know, it's even uh, stuff that you don't see. And, how, and I'd, I'd like to share a little story and an example that goes on, on, along the, you know, to kind of reassure you. Briefly. Briefly, yes. briefly. Uh, what, corn, yeah? Uh, there, there's a lot of corn that is consumed in Africa. And we use a lot of corn as a, as a raw material in making some of our products in, in Africa. And we have very strict norms on the corn for the amount of mycotoxins or aflatoxins in the, the corn, because these are very toxic to human health. And what we found was that we were rejecting, at a point in time, 50% of the corn that came to us from the farmers because they were full of aflatoxins or mycotoxins, which are basically come because of fungal infection and the fungi back battle each other and they release toxins to kill each other, but they have side effects on human health. So we went in and the supply chain and we looked with farmers and we were able to identify that the reason for this mycotoxin infection was the way they were harvesting the corn. They harvested it, 
and then they stored it on the earth in a big heap. So high humidity, high moisture, warm temperatures, growth of fungal spores, mycotoxins release. By changing the method of storing, instead of keeping it in a big heat, store it on concrete and keep it in a flat, you were able to reduce the amount of mycotoxin infection 50% down to 5%. That improved the livelihood of the farmers. It also reduced the risk of contamination from, by taking it out of the supply chain. Yeah? So that's the way we actually work in a very proactive way across the supply chain to manage this. Your point uh, on, on uh, empowering consumers is very appropriate. Uh, more and more modern technology allows us the opportunity to get people to use. So as I mentioned earlier in China, you can actually, consumers can go and scan the QR code at the bottom of the can, and they can link directly to see where the scan came from, what batch codes. Now, is it as sophisticated as it could be? Definitely not, because we have to kind of catch up with technology. Technology is making so much more possible. I fully expect uh, that we will be in a position to offer a great deal more empowerment to consumers to see what is in the products uh, and where the product comes from. Uh, over the next five years, I think this is going to be a huge revolution in the area of food technology. Thank you very much. Um, let's um, have, uh, I wanted to give uh, uh, Tim uh, Ugong a chance to, uh, to respond very briefly. How do we address consumers effectively, uh, GMOs and additives, trust, close us out uh, by taking on uh, one or a couple of those, but I'll need you to be pretty brief. Uh, oh, thank you. On GMOs, I would like to say that it is about um, the capacity of scientists and popular awareness of GMOs at the same time, because there's too many unknowns. Any product should have full disclosure made to consumers of its ingredients. That's what I'd like to say on GMOs. Now, on the right to know, that's very important because we're also talking about user culture. If we had that real user culture, then things would be much better if consumers were more active in taking the matter into their own hands, the rights would be better enforced. Now, if companies had less monopolistic tendencies, then the right to know would be better. Now, finally, regulators must ensure that all the information the consumer deserves is provided as a precondition for the product going onto the market. That would be a way to protect the right now better. Uh, QR codes have just been mentioned just now, and that's a very good example of uh, the sort of innovation that can improve uh, communication with uh, consumers and improve the consumer experience. Thank you very much. Well, um, we actually started the conversation the, before we started the conference, um, uh, the, the, this panel is, what is the number one thing that uh, China needs to do? I mean, here specifically China, like to improve the food safety. And, and what's the weakest link? Mm -hmm. And, and it it's also got, comes back to the point of consumer education. And what, we actually did a, quite a bit of research with um, uh, our industry partners and, and industry associations. And we found that there's, <coughs> there are a lot of myths or miscommunications about <coughs> all the food safety issues being uh, exposed in, in the newspapers. And in, in fact, we took the 10 uh, the, the, the food safety incidents that um, occurred in the last five years and asked the experts to reanalyze them. And we found that seven out of 10 was a more miscommunication, misperceptions to real food safety issues. So how do we make sure that we actually help the consumers understand it, then give them more empowerment to, to really uh, uh, the, the, the monitor and, and improve the overall food safety standards in China? So that, that's critical. And, and that's where the, the industries uh, the, the scientists, academics, and government, media, and consumers, they all play a role here. And, and last but not least is, um, if you look at the newspaper talk about food safety, nine out of 10, or I would say 10 out of 10 is about negative publicity. 
in China, we actually need positive energies because I do think there are many companies, I mean, all the companies on the stage and many other companies that are doing the right thing. And they have a lot of good practices and, and, and promote, so promoting those best practices is actually more important in this stage of the industry developments to, uh, to promote the overall food safety standard. And that's one of the reasons that we work together with um, the medias and, and with the industry associations to start a, a award system called Seven Star. And, and, and which is, I mean, we can talk uh, three hours again in the seven star, but the, the point of that is to, to help promote the best practices among uh, the, the food industries about how they do and why they deserve the trust and, and, and then helping to gain the trust of the, the industry. I think this is a, the getting the consumers aligned and getting the educations and also getting the trust and confidence, confidence back into the industries are critical to develop the, the industries in China. Great. Um, thank you. Excellent way to close. I want to thank um, all four of you. We've heard um, about um, some very quantitative things, science, technology, testing, monitoring, crucially important. We've heard about big institutional decisions, the importance of smart regulation, follow-up enforcement. Let's remember we have these supply chains that go well beyond national borders, and so, uh, so regulation is important, but it's also limited. But interestingly, I think a lot of our discussion focused on, in a sense, the software. Uh, culture, corporate culture, uh, consumer awareness, the fact that transparency is not the same thing as meaning. Let's remember that. There's a lot of information in the world, but that doesn't mean we understand things better in all cases. Um, so a very interesting and rich discussion. I want to, uh, actually, I want to invite all of you to, thank, to join me in thanking uh, our four speakers this morning. Um, uh, very much appreciate your insights and all of you being with us. Thank you very much.